Now to deliver the keynote address, I'd like to invite the founders of Rangde, which is India's first crowdfunding platform that supports rural entrepreneurs and students from low-income households with access to low-cost capital. Rangde, through its online platform, enables individuals to become social investors by providing lending to specific individuals of their choice. Rangde's mission is to leverage the internet and provide access to low-cost capital to underserved communities across India and help them overcome poverty. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ram Krishna and Mrs. Smitha. A big round of applause for them, please. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, just in case uh, you not realize, uh, I and Smitha are also related. We are husband and wife. I um, just want to you know, quickly give you a, a, a quick context on how Rangde came about. Uh, it was the year 2004 when I and Smitha I mean, we just got married and you know, we moved to uh, Kidlington. It's a small village, four miles from Oxford. We started living there, you know, that was our first trip outside the country ever. And it was a great time. After, after about three months of living there, for the first time we began to realize what somebody said, what somebody meant back home when they said India is a, is, India is a developing country. Because for the first time, we were experiencing the developed state. And then, it, you know, we did something which was very interesting in hindsight was, we said, okay, so how much time would it take for India to get to this state? And we said, well, let's simplify this a little bit more. We said, let's identify a village of a similar size, of similar population back in India, and then compare the two states and see what the difference looks like, and then perhaps make an attempt in finding out how much time would it take for India to get there. When we did this exercise, we were struggling for an answer. We said, would it take one lifetime? Would it take two lifetimes? Or would it probably take n number of lifetimes? And we probably don't know how many lifetimes would it take. And that triggered you know, a series of thoughts and we ended up making a resolution, we ma making a pr promise to ourselves, saying that, you know, if we do want to contribute to this, then we would need to get back to India sooner than later. And we gave ourselves two years. We said, two years it is, and then we'll get back to India. So the year we had set for ourselves was 2006. And then, as I say, you know, things magically started happening. I ended up getting a, a dream job in a company called Vignette in the European headquarters. And Smitha ended up getting a government job in the Oxfordshire County Council. And when 2006 came, you know, well, we were not too worried about, you know, what that cause would be, you know, which we would sort of, you know, spend, you know, our time working on. Because if you come from a country like India, you're actually spoiled for choice. You, know, you can pick up any cause and spend your entire life and you would probably still, you know, make a small difference. So when 2006 came, we said, okay, we zeroed down on a few ideas which we have, we have been debating. The first one was child labor. We said that you know, even today in India, child labor has unfortunately become a norm, right? So how do we, you know, fight this? Idea was simple. We said, you know, build an internet platform. We'll, we'll certify organizations, institutions, events that they're child friendly. And we'll charge a fee for that. The second idea we looked at was how do we create rural employment versus rural livelihoods, which is, which is the norm again. And the problem with that is most of us, regardless of our education, regardless of our experience, if given a choice, you know, we would like to work for somebody. But when it comes to the poor, we actually train them on a skill, we give them some amount of capital, and we tell them, congratulations, you're now an entrepreneur. The problem with this thinking is, that a large part of our population actually, you know, they're not entrepreneurs by choice. Because they don't have a choice, they end up becoming entrepreneurs. Idea was simple again, have a hub and spoke model. A city like Bangalore will become a hub and we'll have spokes which will be, you know, uh, 60 to 80 kilometers from Bangalore. All the villages around the city would create services which the hub would consume. The third idea was how do we build empathy in Indians living in India and outside India for India. 
very often what happens is we, we don't even know what the problem is. Uh, we, you know, our, un, you know, very often our understanding is limited to about 140 characters and we probably search and, and you know, whatever we see is what we are, for, for instance, if you were to say, oh, well, microcredit, well, I know what microcredit is all about. It's about giving tiny loans to the poor. But there's a lot more to it. So we felt that if we were to get people close enough to a problem and leave them alone, something magical would come out of it. Either they would do something to, you know, they would plan to do right away, or they might plan to do a few years down the line. But, but the idea was, again, to build this platform. And eventually, the idea was to make it a 24 bar 7 television channel, which would essentially talk about problems which really matter to the, to the country. And finally, microcredit, because Mohammed Yunus and Grameen Bank had jointly won the Nobel Peace Prize. And our first initial reaction was, well, India doesn't need microcredit because, well, we're far better off than Bangladesh. And by the way, by, back then, India was shining. So, you know, we were, you know, we felt that, you know, we have such a beautiful country. So, but we were, we Googled it a bit and we found an article which was published on Rediff in 2004. And we were reading this in 2006 which spoke about how borrowers who had borrowed from a microfinance institution in, in Hyderabad, some of them had committed suicide. The article went on to talk about that the, the district collector of Hyderabad back then passed an order saying that all the borrowers who have borrowed need not pay them back. There was a big hue and cry. Vijay Mahajan and other thought leaders in the sector came rushing to the district collector and said, sir, please take your order back because this is a sunrise industry. You will go nowhere if you do not take it back. The district collector said, I understand what Mohammed Yunus is doing in Bangladesh, but this is not what you are doing in India. Your interest rates are 50% plus. This is not going to help you know, anyone. So you need to go back, think about it, and do something about it. So what we noticed was between 2004 and 2006, nothing much had happened. The interest rate hovered in the range of 45% to 60%. Largely because there was no regulation, the government expressed its inability not to regulate a se sector which was so nascent in, in, its, in its journey. And, 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 you know, and that was you know, the time when we couldn't help but wonder that here is a classic case of a product designed exclusively for the poor but so expensive that the rich cannot afford it. And that is when you know, Rangde as an idea was born. From day one, you know, we were very clear that we would leverage consumer internet to deliver low cost credit to the truly underserved. And the way we define at Rangde the is we call them the first time borrowers. These are borrowers who have either been denied credit or who have not been offered credit. Uh, and so that's been, you know, uh, so, so uh, to cut a long story short, you know, we got lucky, we, we, we pooled our own savings of 6,000 pounds, managed to get a, you know, a bunch of techies from Infosys to come on board, who are also the part of the team which built Finical for Infosys. So one thing led to the other, and finally we got the support of Dr. Nachiket Moore was the Deputy Managing Director of ICSA Foundation, and we went on to set up Rangde. So we just completed eight years. Uh, it's been uh, a long journey, and I let uh, you know uh, Smita talk about some of the you know uh, the work which we have done, and if we do have some time after that, I would like to also you know come back and talk something ab about a, a new experiment which we are doing at Rangde. Something that we were very clear on right from the beginning was, you know, we would work in a partnership model. So, you know, we realized that India being the kind of country we are, every community has its own nuances. And then we can't really apply a cookie cutter model or we can't really go on with a one one size fits all sort of a model and scale uh, scale rapidly. So we were very clear that we'll work with smaller communities, we'll work with uh, communities that don't have access to credit, and we'll work with partners. Our partners were basically NGOs, community-based organizations, the self-help groups that were already 
working with the communities had some amount of trust with them had a track record there was a comfort factor the communities know who these people were so we didn't go around setting our operations everywhere we were very clear we would continue to be the bridge between people who want to actually support individuals want to make a difference to people who actually need them through a network of community based organizations so to give you an example in bangalore we work with an organization called hasiru dala and uh, this is a very interesting partnership because for the first time actually three organizations came together to make this happen so there was rangde and you know our community of social investors bringing in the capital there was s3 idf an organization based in bangalore working with small entrepreneurs micro entrepreneurs in urban areas and there was hasiru dala that actually works with waste with the waste picker community so what hasiru dala did was was they've already been forming collectives of waste pickers for them they got stuck when these waste pickers had to go on to manage the dry waste collection centers because suddenly from being a waste picker they were becoming entrepreneurs so how would they actually go on to manage those dry waste collection centers they needed hand holding they needed access to credit they needed to know how do we we actually run this as a business so hasirudalla said we know who these guys are we can vouch for you sri idf said we already have the expertise of working with entrepreneurs micro entrepreneurs in urban india so we can actually bring in the expertise of mentoring them and rang they actually came in with the capital and we actually designed a loan program that works for the waste pickers based on their cash flows based on their business and we've been working with them for over a year it took us almost 6 to 8 months to make this partnership happen because there are three organizations coming together it meant several meetings uh, it sounds very simple now but then there was a lot of groundwork that needed to be done so what i'm trying to say here is every community we work with has these unsung heroes has these partners that we work with and we design our interventions based on what actually the community needs there's also an org- organization called swami vivekananda youth movement that we work in mysore and we when we started off we chose a group of street vendors and street vendors as you are aware are you know highly exploited they borrow at exorbitant interest rates almost at 10% per day so when svym started working with them they said let's form them into self help groups first and they're also considered to be very risky groups in terms of lending so no traditional microfinance institution was even lending to them so what svym did was to actually form them into self help groups bring them into a discipline of meeting regularly saving some money opening bank accounts for them and then they link them to rangde when we started working with the street vendor community they found it hard to believe our interest rates because this was a community that was used to paying 10% per day and it took them some time to realize that with rangde they were actually paying 10% per annum and after about 2 months because of the savings they were able to make they realized the importance of rangde uh similarly we work with an organization called vigyan ashram in uh, in pune um again a very interesting model because we work with young entrepreneurs there people who have passed out of the legendary vigyan ashram are basically school dropouts nobody found any hope in them uh, vigyan ashram actually trains them on science on how do we actually make science relevant to our daily lives and a lot of entrepreneurs have actually gone on to create products that and even filed for patents there what the problem was they were highly edu- educated because of what happened in vigyan ashram had the entrepreneurial ability and got stuck when it came to capital so again a beautiful model where we actually created an incubation cell with the help of vigyan ashram started to work with these entrepreneurs and then rangde comes in with credit very customized credit based on their you know cash flows and their uh, business models and we've been working with them for a year So in the last 8 years we have built about a network of 28 partners on the ground all of them working with you know communities that never had access to credit and like ram said first time borrowers and we have given about 36 crores as social investments all raised mostly from individuals very few institutions have actually you know uh, supported the initiative so people like you and me about 8500 of us who have actually given this capital a repayment rate of about 99% now and i'm very very happy and proud to say that 
there has not been a single case of willful default from the communities where the community has refused to pay and you know uh, we have had to suffer because of that there have been delays maybe because of mismanagement at the partners end but it's never been bef uh, because of the community so it's been a fantastic journey and uh, I'd let Ram talk about a uh, fewer new initiatives that have come up as a result of our work with Rangbe. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, we'll. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just want to know how did you come up with the word Rangbe and what signifies? Okay, so just that everybody knows the, why the name Rangbe. So there's a long answer and the short answer. So I'll give the long answer first. But so what happened really was. So when we were going through this whole, you know, experience of actually saying that, you know, you know, how would we, how can we get about, you know, a significant change in, in, in the, you know, in the current state of the country? Uh, would it happen if we gave our money? Would it happen if we gave our time? Or would it happen if we gave ourselves up? I think we felt, you know, the third option was the right, op right one to do which means that you do a little bit more than the other two. That's where the uh, uh, came, yeah, that's where the, the inspiration came. Uh, that was the long answer, but the short answer was the domain name was available. So we were absolutely lucky, uh, very fortunate to get the domain name. Um, yeah, so um, I just want to take two minutes and talk about very briefly, uh, because of the theme of this um, event of Synergy, uh, what we really wanted to talk about is to say that uh, over our journey, in the, you know, about a, uh, you know four years back when we started working with artisan communities, we noticed that we were providing credit to the communities, and when we started measuring impact of you know what that credit created for the communities, we realized that it wasn't creating a substantial impact, and the reason was that. Even though they got credit at you know the at a very low cost or sort affordable of credit, they did not get a fair access to a marketplace. So as a consequence, regardless of how much credit they received, they still had to pay a heavy price because they didn't get access to credit. So we wrote a, a note uh, on this of many years ago, but happy to share that last year we launched this as an idea. Uh, to essentially complement the efforts of all our partners who work with communities who do not have a fair access to a market. Let me drive home what that means. There are two points, two data points which are re really worth talking about. In India, across the country, barring a few communities, artisans, these are highly skilled artisans, get paid less than the government prescribed wages for unskilled labor, regardless of whether they follow fair trade or not. As a consequence, as a consequence, you know, whenever there is a Narega, M Narega scheme or a government scheme to, you know, to for manual labor, they would go forward and participate in it. The other data point is, you know, Fab India and the likes of Fab India, many of many stores out there, online, offline more than 95% of what they actually sell is actually made on a power loom. If you are lucky, the power loom would be in India. If not, it could be anywhere in the world. So what we've done is essentially do two things radically different and this is a new experiment we, we're calling it Habba, H-A-B-B-A, Habba.org. Uh, it's a Kannada word, stands for festival. Uh, what we're trying to do is two things. One, for the first time perhaps in the world, when you go onto a product page on Hubba, you can click on the price and it will open up. You would get to see what percentage of the money you are paying reaches the artisan. The second thing we have done is come up with a new label called, a new certification label called Hand Over Heart. So, and this certification essentially what it does is just does one thing very well apart from other things. It certifies what percentage of that product was indeed handmade. Anything less than 60% we won't even sell it on Hubba. 
so this is i will leave it i will leave you with that thought uh, and uh, we're going to do a full public launch on 1st of may this year uh, but but just just want to share this uh, as an example of trying to bridge uh, inefficiencies in the in the ecosystem good morning uh, thank you both very much it was very very interesting the way and very inspiring i wanted to know the the aspect of fair access to marketplace i would like a little bit more explanation how do you create a fair access to marketplace so what are your thoughts on it yeah so uh, the uh, okay, let me just you know sorry i'm just yeah okay so i think uh, let me drive this by two examples um terracotta earrings i'm sure many of you uh, are aware of terracotta earrings uh this retail in bangalore for about 250 rupees upwards they can go as high as 850 rupees uh the irony is that if you ask people in the industry people in the know they will tell you that artisan ka rate fixed hai right there's a fixed price the artisan gets all the time regardless of the retail price and and that amount is 10 rupees right let me give you another example madhubani paintings i'm sure all of you know madhubani paintings it's a very popular art form from bihar an a4 size sheet of paper to 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 make that painting it takes about a day uh in bangalore if you go to any of the art you know even if you go to a small art shop they would sell you this is you are lucky you have got a deep discount on this they will sell you it at about 3000 rupees the artisan's rate is fixed if they use natural colors they get 100 rupees if they use chemical colors they get 80 rupees so what has happened unfortunately for many years the status quo has been maintained no one has questioned it no one has tried to break that massive information asymmetry which exists between us as customers and the artisans so we have an information asymmetry as well we don't know the real story right even though we buy from the marketplace the artisans also do not know the real story because they feel that you know this is how it has been for so many years so we are trying to break that uh, and we are also trying to do quite a few you know we're trying to do a few innovations uh, around the model as well uh, idea largely being what is driving really is that can we create empathy in customers like ourselves for the artisans because for way too long the focus has always been on the art which is the product and the art form with zero absolutely you know even a reference to the artisan themselves and that's the that's the approach they are trying to find jobs in the supermarkets and you know our malls here because they don't take pride in that traditional art form anymore so unless we actually make this lucrative i don't think the art forms will continue for a long time hi uh, good morning i am satish i represent uttara so my question to uh, ram is like you know you you said uh, you have done a marketplace for all artisans right uh i was thinking of creating one marketplace for niche uh, arts right now when i say niche arts it's almost the idea is almost same like go to for example chenna patna get the toys you know and put it on the marketplace and sell it and the idea is like give them the respect what they have to get like probably 60 40 or 50 50 whatever it is you know so have you thought you know uh, going to that level or it little above still oh, no no so so we are going to you know definitely chana parna for sure uh, uh, we're just getting started so we're building the entire infrastructure right uh, so i remember the early days you know one of my team members said so what scale are we looking at and, and they said you know are you looking at an amazon scale of building this and it's absolutely So I think what we're really doing is, you know, because of the scale and you know the size, I think we're really building, you know, the building blocks as we speak. So definitely, you know, and I think the larger vision for Hubba is to create a new asset class. You know, given that we're in the 
prestigious management institute, uh, a new asset class called FMCH, fast moving consumer handicrafts. Because I think that is what is needed. Because it doesn't really matter for the artisan, you know, if his art is being appreciated. What really matters to him is he needs to know which of his creations have a high market value. And if he gets to know that, he would focus on that and, you know, focus on, you know, getting a profit share for perhaps for the first time. So that's, that's the aspiration. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the roadmap. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Nitin. Uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, Mr. Ramakrishna and uh, Smita on this uh, effort. Um, I want to know the, in the whole cycle, when you are actually uh, putting in capital, there are other aspects of uh, training and business model for these local entrepreneurs or artisans and like, you know, uh, when you work with uh, these local vendors there. Uh, so uh, how do you tackle those issues? Because many a times you are taking the risk of putting in the money, but you also know that there is a lack of training or there is a, the business model is not going to uh, give back the returns. Yeah, so I think, um, so we categorize our livelihood activities into different segments. And um, the thing is, even though we provide credit, we have not been able to train, we have not been able to directly train the entrepreneurs. So in the examples that I gave you of Vigyan Ashram and Hasiru Dala, we actually identify a partner who will be able to do that. And there are larger loan amounts, like about say 40,000 rupees per individual. It can go up to even 5 lakhs per individual or enterprise. When it comes to smaller sustenance sort of livelihood activities, like somebody is running a poultry, somebody wants to, you know, uh, buy a cow, and these are mostly in remote areas what we've been doing is starting off with the basic financial literacy programs again with the help of partners like the local partner we work with there's also a partnership with NABAR that we have which we are actually running in three states where we are trying to see what what is the impact of mentorship because we firmly believe that credit is not equal to impact credit is an enabler of impact and credit needs to be coupled with enough financial guidance and assistance for people to actually take their businesses to the next level and sometimes because of their own literacy levels they're not even able to understand if they run two or three income generation activities which is that activity that is more profitable than the others so the basic financial literacy program trainings that we are enabling in all the communities before they actually take a loan helps them realize if there are three activities in what season which activity will fetch them more but I would say that there's a lot more that we need to do here so at this point it's all partnership based we develop that program based on what that community needs and we raise funds for that because we don't have adequate funds to deliver those training you know one is capital that comes from social investors that goes as debt but these are grant based programs so that's why partnerships with NABAD partnerships with other organizations that are helping us do that we totally realize the importance of it have done several pilots of it but not really at scale and i think that's something we really need to do yeah and just uh, in addition to that like so there are there is a business model part of that uh, of yeah. these local entrepreneurs and we have seen that when they are involved in like one single activity uh, we most of the time it is not very sustainable sure. to pay back the loan and to actually sustain themselves sure. and to reinvest in their own business sure. now um, we, you need to club new activities or you need to really uh, think through these uh, models and you know institutes different institutes or you know some intellectual uh, investment is required there i think that is a big challenge which is out there and i, I don't know means like you must have experienced this a lot in, in, in your work. yeah and we have also tried to explore a lot of partnerships like you know business schools with uh, corporates to actually see a partnership where a mentorship program can actually be introduced at the community level because all it needs is really the human capital right to be able to go there work with the entrepreneur but again we have not been able to do that at scale it's just been I know small experiments the max I would say out of the 45,000 loans that we have actually given out say about 20 to 22,000 would have actually received some basic financial literacy program or a mentorship to actually take their business to the next level otherwise it's very basic hand holding that they get at the moment thank you
Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Srivatsa. I represent a company called Jivabhumi. We work with uh, small and marginal farmers to provide uh, sustainable livelihoods. Uh, my question really is, um, while organizations such as you and us are relentlessly trying to build the impact, what's your advice uh, for those um, um, you know, social impact organizations on, on building their own sustainable revenue model? So where, where does that, that go? How does that work? I'll let Ram. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, well, uh, it's not enough time, so but I'll try and quickly attempt. So uh, we went through this ourselves. So when we started, you know, we were very clear that, you know, we would not do this for profit, right? We, in the early days, uh, we politely refused all the private equity offers we received. Uh, we took the grant route largely because we felt that, you know, we need to make it, uh, initially we would need some grant support and then we would, you know, be sustainable, self-sustainable, we'll have enough revenues to, you know, uh, pay for expenses. So while getting into that mode, we noticed that the, the even though we got lucky, we got the support initially from the foundation, but eventually you know, there was no more capital coming in. So we chose the path, which again, which was you know very well documented by Mohammed Yunus himself. He talks about a new kind of a business model, which is a social business model, which is neither a non-profit, neither a for-profit, which legally is a non-profit, but it's self-sustainable. So what it, essentially it is is a non-loss and a non-dividend paying company. So Rangde is a Section 8 company or a Section 25 company, and we're happy to share that we were we did launch our investment prospectus, and we got a good response, and happy to share that in response to the, our investment prospectus, perhaps next month. I'm not too sure about the timeline, but in a in a month or so, you would see world's first social equity fund being launched in Bangalore. For all the organizations. Uh, who have or want to have a sustainable model, right? Not, you know, compromising on impact. You know, they would be very, you know, you, you know, they would be great candidates for this. Uh, it's not just an incubator; it's also an accelerator. So one of its kind, uh, backed by the Tata Trust, right? So all that's all I can say right now. <laughs> but but you'll see a lot of action, a lot of uh, you know uh, on that front. So please stay tuned. Uh, and uh, okay, I can tell you the name of the fund. It's called Social Alpha. Social Alpha. Yeah. So, so I think so. The good news is that we have something now. Uh, very soon, we'll have something now very soon.